farther back, trudges ignorant and barefoot to a cave in some pre-literate age where people only speak to one another, simple words that echo in the ear and vanish, pageless epics spun of memory and breath sewn upon the easy and forgetful air. In a poem called uh, Counting the Faces, it, uh, as, uh, walking down these you know, avenues in New York um, and seeing all these faces. I mean, uh, New York is really a walking city, and, and LA is a driving city, as, as we know. We don't really walk down the street very much. So in New York, of course, everybody's on the street all the time. So you walk down, you can walk just from 4th to 5th you know, on one avenue and see the most repulsive looking person you've ever seen in your life and the most incredibly beautiful person you've ever seen in your life and everything in between in the space of that one block. I mean, it just it amazes me. Um, but uh, so anytime I had trouble writing, I just got up and walked around town and came back and started again. But uh, um, it also occurred to me when I looked at people's faces, I had this little illumination about, about that. It's called counting the faces. If knowledge is received, like a package for a guest. What do we really know? Below the bridge, a wood piling on which someone has stacked worn tires like donuts on a pole. We can track our, we can trap our image in a photo, then look back at ourselves as if from outside. And there may be more photos of people in existence than people themselves. Each face is the culmination of an act. So to walk down the street is to gaze into the body of time. The tires are there to cushion ships that rumble up and toss a rope through with voyaging. Right now, a workman in my neighbor's yard looks up at me, then turns away, his face carved out of mahogany and stone knives. What fades is the voice but the face remains fixed in the clear emulsions of the brain. Each face, the culmination of desire, an act so secret and forgotten, we can never know. Before all this, the tires journeyed between coasts, burning themselves against the miles. And by now, there are so many pictures of us. We can never hope to gather them together for a last look. I realize these, these, these little ideas keep coming in, like, you know, gathering together something again, or, and Plato keeps showing up. I don't know. I don't know why. This is a poem about, um, um, uh, well, the Vietnam War Memorial gets into this poem, and I'm kind of talking about that. I don't know if it, you've had a chance to visit that. But it's also, uh, it just starts out with a, a, a freezing, frigid day in New York. You don't know any of that here, but it really gets cold there. Three below. Three below, and water won't freeze. Finally, I can see my breath again. People all over town exhale tiny cyclones of smoke. All that agony congealing into a black stone. And that shoe bobbing on the surface of the bay, it's been floating there for the past 20 years. Water shivers near a curb, some salt or oxide barring ice, a glitch in the atmosphere. It hangs there, heel up, as though someone simply stepped out of it and sidled away. On the empty doorframe of a rundown house, there are three ink marks, one for each child. Memory is a form of absence, the embodiment of nothing, a residue of thought. It curves demurely into the past, a single gravestone for 50,000 dead. Flesh turns waxy, then numb. You can push it into various shapes. This is the first sign. Sometimes even your fingerprints aren't enough. Proof of your existence dwindles to a photograph. And if these puddles are scabs, those marks might be a measure of the children's vanishing. Memory, finally, is all we are, but memory falters, a streak of light on polished granite. 
What if that wall reached halfway around the world? What if it slowly girdled the earth? Who could survive such cold? I'll just read a few more, a couple more. Um, um, th three more, and then back at Elise. Um, so, okay, so we're taking a little walk down Sixth Avenue. It's a poem called Avenue, and um, it, it, it's an impressionist poem, which means that these, imp these things are coming at you very quickly in this poem. Uh, so they're just impressions, so just let them go by as you hear them. Um, uh, there's a lot of different things happening, and sometimes I'm, I'm talking about signs that I see, you know, like mark down or, you know, sale, you know, holiday sale or whatever it is. But all of this gets in the poem. It gets in very quickly because all these things come at you rapidly. Avenue. Parade of light, promenade of wind, a frigid gust plucks pigeons from the roof and hurls them aloft. Flats of gym crack glitter on the walk, orphaned books, noncommittal watches, menu slates propped open, chalked with soups, the day's confections, tattooed, marked down, made in Honduras, speaking Russian, Spanish, Mandarin, Comanche. I stroll among bargains, the littered faces, now playing, so many human souls, discounted for a week. One man cuffs another on the arm, spins him into traffic where horns blast, bumpers shudder and swerve as the argument flares. Three cops look on amused. My father walked here, mother too, all the people I've ever known, looking for subterranean records, prawns, little Havana. When I'm here, I'm no one or everyone, shooting hoops, dodging trucks that racket over stone, though how we got here, more or less, a mystery, one of Attila's wives, Caesar, stripped of arms, the Aztec features of a workman feeding pipe into a hole. Whenever we throng together, we are newly renovated, marked down and nameless, no more hope, no more fantasy parties, but the siren song of flames, football's tinny voice pressured through a box, push them back to other avenues, side streets, alleys, into buildings, rooms. Even at midnight, the moon's bloated countenance, the subway's phonic roar, those who slumber in the park, and those who slump in doorways, municipal bedrock, breathing steam. We don't know where the avenue begins, like a river, its source in free appraisals, or where it ends beyond us in damaged goods, knowing only the cracked light, the vertical paths we took to escape, knowing only it remains, long after spring sails, the final arrests, bodies which we sidestep, being careful to avert our eyes, a broken horn bellowing, help, 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 help. And I'll finish by reading uh, two poems about water. I guess water scares me, <laughs> reading these poems. I just started reading them the last week and I thought, what am I so afraid of about water? I don't know. But uh, I, this one's called River, and, and, I, and I, I'm hap happy to read it here because it was the way I got, uh, got in touch with Redhead Press. I mean, I sent this poem to, to Mark for the Los Angeles Review, and they, they printed it, and then he asked me if I had a manuscript, and I did. And I mean, a, po a poet always has another manuscript lying around <laughs> ready to go. So, I mean, that's, that's how that happens. So, uh, River. Not the source or the destination, not even the middle in its constant motion. And not without resistance, the river hurries in its current, implacable sleeve of water. Traveling at all points, where is it? And if nowhere, what is this flowing? Not the sky, but the anchor of the sky. Not the bank, but the meaning of the bank. The river wanders, but it's always here its root a fissure in the earth, its fate to fall and be gathered and fall, its surface scaled viridian, its depth a drag of old newsprint and erosion, the past accumulating towards the future. Cross it and the nations hold their breath, block it and its power deepens. A thought of the river 
is the river itself, its mind a sunfish, its heart a cloud. Wildest when shallow, it grows by moving, unlike us, spawning life, and where it meets with islands, yields to reconverge in self-healed folds like flesh. An omnivore, it feeds by daylight. Ophidian, it swallows whole, adding the world's detritus to itself. Heart of rubber, soul of tin, a scroll of metaphor that also stinks, giving up rank mud, the bloated dead, in dusky pools of light. The river is a feeding trough, uncertain mirror, shattering walls, transplanting continents grain by incremental grain, an eon's hourglass of elemental silt that bends serenely into ever-lowering night. We shall gather at the river when the world ends. And uh, I'll finish with this little poem called Pond, just four lines, Pond. How it resembles a myth in its inner shining, a little kingdom, a sunken palace of weeds. Within its borders, silence and the unknown. You may enter it briefly. If you stay, you die. The poet Kurt Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's my privilege now to introduce Eloise Klein-Healy, the author of six books of poetry, most recently The Islands Project, Poems for Sappho, from Red Hen Press in 2007. And Eloise has been the recipient of a variety of awards, uh, and those things are important. But what strikes me as more important is that, on the one hand, uh, she's a master technician, but on the other, and this really is the thing, it seems to me that the speaker who inhabits these poems shows a rare level of loyalty to the experience of the unique individual person, which is a category upon which the salvation of each and all of us depends, but which is, it seems to me, afforded less and less respect as with every day that goes by in our culture. Um, I'll read you a little four line or eight line little excerpt from a fairly old poem that to me exemplifies this fundamental chord um, in the verbal music that Eloise Klein Healy composes and that's this thing from The Abundance of Magpies. Ready or not, here at Cat Canyon Road, this dotted line of highway crossing marks the boundary of the yellow-billed magpies range. To see one south of here tests the scope of scientific reality. Not the magpies, though. <laughs> there seems to be no contempt for the effort to organize our world with its blooming, buzzing confusion into some kind of navigable, negotiable system of categories, labels, avenues, streets, ranges, boundaries, and so on. But there's an even greater and more fundamental respect, suffused with loyalty and, and uh, humane engagement for the individual experience, which not only transcends all these labels, but puts them out of play without destroying them, as does the rising sun to a candle flame. Ladies and gentlemen, Eloise klein -Healy. I'm going to tell that to the next magpie I see. <laughs> hey, is there any water in this joint? Thank you, William. This is a hot room. So, hi. Hi, everybody. I won't wait for my water. I'll just plunge in. Um, since Kurt just read a poem about a river, I was thinking, oh, that is so lovely. And I have a poem about a river, so I'm going to read one, too. So I'll have two rivers in here today, maybe even more, because I have another poem, I think, that I was going to read today that has a river in it. Um, this, well, maybe it's 
got a river, but maybe it's not about the river. <laughs>